a pleasure for me to be able to introduce our speaker. Um, I think you know, from, he's not in this picture actually, by the way. Um, but uh, um, but um, as you know from the circle, uh, the, what was circulated, um, our, our speaker is John Q. Barrett. Um, and he's our speaker today for three reasons. Um, and um, the first, I think, is probably obvious to all of you already. As you saw both um, a little brief on his uh, very distinguished academic background, um, and the second part of the title, um, which is Immigration, Citizens, Power, and Liberty. Um, and his uh, approach um, and his academic or his, his, uh, his academic um, life started at Georgetown and um, uh, a law degree at Harvard and then um, onto a clerkship at the Federal Appeals Court Third Circuit, is that right? Then um, uh, he, he joined a, um, the Lawrence Walsh's operation, which is in the Iran-Contra special prosecutor. Does if any of that resonates with kind of the current events? It's not accidental before becoming um, counselor to the Inspector General of the Department of Justice and then joining the Academy. Um, there's the explanation for that second part of his title uh, in this group doesn't need any further, but um, it is worth uh, the first uh, a little bit of explanation on the first part of that title that reference to to uh, Robert Jackson, which is actually the global health reference, and we'll probably get into that a little bit. But uh, Robert Jackson is a uh, um, is actually in our generations um, not so well known, but a citizen of New York. And uh, one of the persons who actually one of the most instrumental people in setting up the foundations of what is modern international health. And I think uh, John may refer to some of that and anything he doesn't, I'll pick up in, in the questions. Um, the third reason is that we actually are, uh, is about public education and education of the public. And uh, we pride ourselves in public education and public health. Um, John uh, has actually developed a, 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 and epitomized the, the model of a, a model of education of the public, which actually reflects the person he has spent his life studying, Robert Jackson. And it's um, the the Jackson list that he puts out is just a, and maybe which he'll have more subscribers uh, after today. Um, is just a, a gentle, thoughtful. Um, regular reminder of people um, that um, the problems that we face have been faced before and have been dealt um, not with celebrity, um, but with modesty and with thoughtfulness and with scholarship, and that we've navigated through many of those. And so he has actually spent um, his time not only studying the life of Robert Jackson, but I would, I would say also emulating his kind of the um, that, that modesty and scholarship that uh, that Robert Jackson brought to the Supreme Court and elsewhere in his life. And I don't want to get into that because we have the world's expert of that here, and I'm hoping he's going to, to give us some insights in that. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you to our, our speaker, John Barry. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim and Dean and all of you for the invitation to be with you this afternoon. I have been lucky to be invited to lecture in some um, illustrious settings and strong institutions and interesting locales. Uh, you are my first school of public health uh, and I am a New Yorker uh, and I'm very interested in what you're doing and building here in this institution and how your discipline and disciplines actually connect fundamentally with mine, which is law and the historical development of law. Um, I am here to talk to you about uh, the highfalutin concepts that are in the title of this talk, uh, but really I, I, I hope to break it down into some quite accessible pieces, including, since I am a biographer, a life and a trajectory in a life that connects with very practical problems 
and the challenges of operationalizing high values in practical contexts. That's what I do, that's what you do, and I dare say it, that's what they do, and that's what anybody does, and Robert Jackson uh, is on that list. And so I'm gonna tell you a bit about him. I'm gonna begin with immigration, and then turn into the life of Robert Jackson and how that becomes a story of applied work in the field of human rights, and then return to the topic of immigration, um, leaving some time for some colloquy and questions uh, among us. Uh, I also thank Jim for the commercial for my Jackson list, uh, which is a couple of email notes a month. Uh, it is a beast that's kind of grown to a very large subscriber list. If you Google Jackson list, you'll get the archive site, which has hundreds of essays. And if you pop me an email, you are welcome to be in the next ad batch. Uh, and then you'll get a couple of notes from me a month, whereas my teenage at the time daughter once said, it's a quick delete. Um, <laughs> I love her anyway. Um, so uh, here are the three parts. Um, I'm gonna talk about the US Supreme Court in the context of immigration, but I'm gonna talk about immigration as a human dynamic, and that's an aerial view of Ellis Island. And I'm gonna talk about Robert Jackson. Uh, first, as to immigration, I wanna um, give you a thought experiment, which I heard somebody else try in an audience, and I thought it was very provocative. I'm going to name some countries uh, and tell me if you immediately get uh, a demographic racial predominance that defines that place. Uh, for example, South Africa. Okay? Uh, Sweden. Russia. China. The United States. Hmm. And that actually, if, if your reaction was different, uh, you know, China's filled with people of Chinese ancestry and Russia is filled with Russians and, you know, uh, but if the United States might be different, I think we've touched something about why immigration is such a salient and complicated topic in our time. Um, of course, you know, there were once, there are Native Americans. Uh, but they were dispossessed and deluded, and as a fractional population no longer define who this country is, this country has been populated by people who came here involuntarily, voluntarily across many centuries, etc. That makes up what the United States is. Uh, and once upon a time, immigration was not a legal, illegal uh, matter in this country. Everybody just came uh, through the 19th century you know, it was kind of an open door, open harbors, uh, whoever could disembark from a ship uh, voluntarily or involuntarily became part of this country. Um, and that history connects with our Constitution. All that the U.S. Constitution says with regard to immigration is in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4, where it is specified that the Congress, the federal legislature, has the power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. In other words, to define by statute the terms on which people, arrivers, become naturalized to become among us in the United States. Now, of course, there are other broader provisions in the US Constitution that also bear on immigration. Article two, which defines presidential power in the Constitution, says that the executive power uh, is the power to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. So whatever Congress enacts as uniform rules of naturalization is the president's to enforce, uh, to take care that those laws be faithfully executed. And over a complex series of decisions, many decades, the US Supreme Court has interpreted the constitutional powers of this country to be a plenary national power in the realm of immigration. In other words, states don't make their own immigration policies. The US government, as a unitary matter, defines our immigration. And that plenary power has been exercised by the Congress to create immigration laws. Um, there are really kind of three major ones that are operative. The open door through the 1920-21 period led to a sort of nativist uh, 
uh, fear and reaction which led to the immigration laws and quotas of 1924. And then decades later, uh, that system got reworked into the modern immigration and preference system with the immigration law of 1965. And then in the 1980s, the Simpson-Mazzoli Act that President Reagan signed into law uh, was an amnesty and naturalization for a lot of people who did not have legal status in the country at that point, uh, but then uh, employer sanctions and so forth tried to declare the immigration problem solved. Uh, and of course it isn't. Uh, and we haven't succeeded politically in statutorily dealing with immigration really since the 1980s. Uh, close and efforts, President Bush, President Obama, uh, not so much President Trump, uh, but those are the statutory landscapes uh, subject to presidential enforcement, including through executive orders. That brings us to this Supreme Court. This is the court featuring second seated from the left, Justice Anthony Kennedy. That was the Supreme Court through the end of last term. Kennedy, of course, then retired and was succeeded by Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Um, and I will show us a slide of that court later in the talk. But this was the court that in June of this year decided the constitutionality of President Trump's executive order um, that established country suspicion categories to evaluate the visa granting and screening process out there that led to people coming to this country. This was the third iteration of the so-called Muslim ban. Um, President Trump took office, of course, in January of 2017, and in the first week in office, promulgated a very slapdash and blunt and Christian preferring and Muslim nation of origin or Arab nation of origin barring executive order. Courts immediately enjoined it. The executive branch sort of scrubbed it to terminate those cases, enacted a second executive order by presidential decree. Courts enjoined it. The executive branch scrubbed it and enacted a third executive order. And it identified a list of countries that are security concerns for which the visa granting process was of concern, which we declared a freeze on, subject to study. Most of those are nations of Muslim origin majority populations, but not entirely. And courts enjoined it, and courts of appeals affirmed those injunctions, and that case went to the US Supreme Court. It's called Trump versus Hawaii, and it was decided by the Supreme Court last June, which upheld five to four President Trump's exercise of executive power to put that freeze on those specified countries. Why, given all his rhetoric as a candidate and fairly blunt evidentiary material saying this is aimed at nations and ethnicities and religions and thus inherently suspect under our constitutional doctrine, did the court uphold it? Because held five justices, Chief Justice Roberts writing for the majority, the president is entitled to enunciate a national security concern and whatever else might be going on, including potentially ugly thinking, if the president declares this is about national security, it is the judicial job to defer to that exercise of the plenary power that the president has to take care that the immigration laws and the national security laws be faithfully executed. That's the Supreme Court backing out, if you will, of uh, active role in second guessing or enforcing other constitutional values like non-discrimination, like anti-discrimination against religion in the face of a president's national security demand. How many people descend from people who entered through one of our ports of entry, either this one or Philadelphia or Charleston or many others, me too. Um, I want to just have you look at Ellis Island and think about the experience of those forebears, which of course is not all of us by any means, uh, and others had forebears who went through much worse and involuntary and uh, not this system. Uh, but think about the experience of your forebears and then of course project that and think with sensitivity of any immigrant, any would-be entrance personal experience today. Because what we are talking about is a human individual need, move, uh, desperation or calculation situation of 
I think, sympathy of something that the heart should feel. And I believe the heart, even at these levels in structured proceedings, does feel. The question is, what's the place of that, of the human feeling, in a system of law in a world of structures that are based on national sovereignty? Robert Jackson dealt with these kinds of issues. He was born in 1892. He died in 1954. His birth is a humble farm upbringing in small town New York. And then in 20 years, he rises to become quite a successful young lawyer in private practice in Western New York State. Then he goes to the New Deal, and he rises like a meteor under Fr President Franklin Roosevelt. In a seven-year period, this is his trajectory, and then I will show you some images. He's appointed by Roosevelt and confirmed by the Senate to a string of jobs. First, he's general counsel of the Revenue Bureau in the Treasury Department. Today, we would call it the general counsel of the IRS. Then he moves over to the Department of Justice, and he's an assistant attorney general, first in tax and then in antitrust. Then he's the solicitor general of the United States, which is the government's advocate in the Supreme Court. Then he's the attorney general of the United States. Then he's an associate justice of the Supreme Court. And all of that in less than seven years. He's 49 years old by the time he goes to the Supreme Court. And then after four years on the Supreme Court, President Truman borrows him. Your country asks, you say yes. Borrows him to become what turns out to be the American chief prosecutor of Nazi war criminals in Nuremberg, Germany, following World War II. And then Jackson returns to the Supreme Court and serves for eight more years, 1946, until his death in 1954. In his last year, he's part of the unanimous court in Brown versus Board of Education that strikes down school segregation. And then, because that's already a very full plate for a biographer, he has the good grace to leave the scene at age 62 because public health and medical care uh, was not what it should have been uh, for people with cardiological problems uh, in the 1950s. Um, with a bypass or two and a stent or two and a little bit of vigorous exercise, uh, I would have a much bigger project as a biographer because he would have had 25 more years. Uh, but that's a full enough plate. This is where it began. Northwestern Pennsylvania in an uh, area in Warren County in a uh, locality called Spring Creek Township, uh, where his great-grandfather was the first white settler. Um, now we're back to immigrants, right? What was this? This is Irish, Scots, English settlers in colonial America, and then after the Revolutionary War, heading out west, out west, which meant Ohio, the Western Reserve, and Indian Wars, and living in stockade forts, and then retreating, and picking a valley and starting to clear the land. And so Jackson's great-grandfather and another fellow clear land and begin to farm, and it looked probably in 1801 a lot like it looks in this relatively recent photo. That's the house that the great-grandfather eventually builds. It's got a little bit of New England style to it, uh, and that's Jackson's parents, and in 1892 he came along. They're a hard-working farm couple, uh, and you can see the animals and the hired man and the bachelor uncle and so forth, uh, but the 20th century was coming. And so Jackson's family moves north from Pennsylvania across the state line into New York State. This is the Hotel Jackson, which was one of the ventures that his father took on. Um, like every wood frame building, uh, it burned to the ground shortly thereafter. Uh, but he had a livery stable, he raced horses, he bought and sold lumber. He was a you know, 1905 entrepreneur. Uh, and Robert Jackson, goes to the small school in that town, Frewsburg, New York, and is a great student, uh, is the valedictorian, don't be too impressed, it was a very small class, uh, but you know, is a, a young, bright, rising man of the early 20th century. Uh, after his graduation from the Frewsburg High School, he commutes by trolley for an additional year up to Jamestown, New York, and that becomes his adult hometown. He goes to the Jamestown High School for a postgraduate year, and I flag this because that's the end of his general higher education, not a day of college. 18 years old, two high school diplomas, if you will, he becomes an apprentice in a two-man law office. And through three years of training, by age 21, one in a law school at Albany, uh, 
uh, he's eligible to take the New York bar exam, and he does, and he becomes a lawyer. Practices in Jamestown for a couple of years, gets recruited up to Buffalo, which is the big city, returns to Jamestown, marries, has children, uh, and starts to fill out in the face. It happens to all of us. Uh, is succeeding in the 1920s, builds a house with white pillars, gets involved through bar association activities in national legal circles, uh, and is really prospering in the 1920s, and his clients are depression-proof, so it doesn't evaporate in 1929. They're real businesses uh, with real customers, etc. cetera. Um, and he has an 88-acre horse farm, and he has a cabin cruiser on Chautauqua Lake, and he has life by the tail. But he wasn't just a lawman. Uh, he believed in engagement with the issues of his time, and politics was his way of doing it, and his family hereditary political allegiance was to Democrats. And from his early year in Albany as a young man, and then in the 1920s and going forward, he had at first a handshake, and then a slight acquaintance, and then it became a connection, and then it became a ripening relationship with somebody who was a rising politician, the guy on the left. He was Frank Roosevelt, and he was 28 years old, and he was a state senator when Jackson, at age 18, met him. But of course, you know, they both rise. And now he's the president of the United States. He's nonchalantly holding on to that post uh, because he has polio and is paralyzed and can't stand without it. But what a dashing, relaxed smile. And Jackson is this fellow. This is when he's at the Revenue Bureau. That's Harold Ickes, who's the Secretary of the Interior. And that's Jesse Jones, the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, and they're on a fishing trip. If any of you fish, I dare say you don't dress this well today. <laughs> um, but this is the glimpse of the New Deal. And this Jackson is, as I said, a rising meteor. He's starting to litigate very high-profile cases. Here he is on the cover of Newsweek defending a big New Deal statute in the Supreme Court. Here he is at his desk in the Justice Department as the Solicitor General. He argues a couple of dozen cases in a two-year period and wins almost all of them. This is the court he's arguing to, which is the court led by Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes, our former governor in New York State, a reform Republican. Um, but this is largely an anti-New Deal court that's starting to turn. That's the court that Jackson's arguing to. And he's winning the constitutionality of Social Security, the National Labor Relations Act, the Public Utility Holding Company Act. This is 1937, 38, 39. Then Jackson becomes Attorney General. This is a posed photo in his conference room. And this is Jackson with Vice President John Nance Garner, a name you haven't heard in a long time, standing outside the White House in 1938, 39, or 1940. Um, Garner's famous for a quip that the vice presidency isn't worth a bucket of warm, and it's always published as spit, but that's not the word he used. Um, he breaks with Franklin Roosevelt, Garner does, in 1940, as Roosevelt is starting to think about, talk about a third term. Um, and so the question is, if Roosevelt doesn't do that, uh, are the New Dealers going to be stuck with this Texas Paul or somebody else? Or are they going to have their own you know, young, dynamic Roosevelt successor? This could have been the path. For a few months in early 1940, Robert Jackson is really being boomed, is what they call it at the time, uh, for President of the United States. And of course, global events intervene, and Franklin Roosevelt is leading a defense buildup and then seeking a third term, unprecedented, and winning it, and so forth. Um, this is in May of 1940. This is the cabinet in the front row. And here you see Attorney General Jackson uh, and various other luminaries. This obscure face over here is a senator from Missouri, um, Truman. I don't know whatever became of the guy, right? Um, and that's, of course, FDR at the podium. So he puts Jackson on the Supreme Court age 49. And Jackson quickly establishes a reputation as a gorgeous writer. He's generally regarded as the best writer in the history of our Supreme Court, as an independent thinker. And unlike some of the other Roosevelt appointees, not a sort of pre-committed vote, a case at a time judge and an independent thinker. He sort of had his politics, but putting the robe on in Jackson's mind meant that the politics kind of stop and the law is my job now. And that's him in his robe, and that's him in the rookie justice position. They have a very 
formulaic seating, but that's him as the new appointee in 1941, and he is on the court for these four years. One of the cases during that time period, which I will return to, is called Korematsu versus United States. Data point, some people know what Korematsu is, we will come back. It's not a case about an immigrant. It's a case about a U.S. citizen. But soon Jackson was in a different courtroom. And this is the fall 1945 Nuremberg courtroom where the Nazi war criminals are arrayed and being prosecuted by the four nations that had won World War II. Uh, and this in the center is the U.S. prosecution table. Uh, and these are where the judges are. I want to briefly chart the path that led to this courtroom for Robert Jackson and for the world because this is the path of international law, of humanitarian values, of human rights. It begins with the horror, the horror first of Hitler coming to power in 1933 and Nazi Germany taking shape in all of its dimensions. Um, this is the Dachau concentration camp, which was opened that spring of 1933. Do not confuse concentration camps in Germany horrible places though they were and became with extermination camps in the East. The latter were designed to kill. These were designed to confine political enemies. You see, this was just fascist power rounding up and incarcerating expeditiously people who were obstacles to what the state was seeking to achieve. So preventive detention, arrest, denial of counsel, confinement of enemies liberals, lefties, communists, labor leaders, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, socialists, etc. Those are people confined in places like Dachau. And the, these are visible places to the world, 1933 forward. The Red Cross visited and, uh, you know, nations are going to do what nations are going to do. What's our business in the 1930s to condemn the centralized power of this state or that state? You know, we run our own affairs. Now, of course, in the war years, these places become murderous and horrible and disease infested and so forth, but this is intra-Germany. This is a Nuremberg rally in 1930s Germany. Uh, Nuremberg, a city in Bavaria, just a little bit north of Dachau, uh, was a symbolically important place for the Nazis because it was one of the summer castle cities of the Holy Roman Emperor. And Hitler and the Thousand Year Reich had this conceit that the, the Third Reich were a successor to the Second Reich, which was Bismarck, and the First Reich, which was the Holy Roman Emperor. And so for you know, continuity and optics and madness, uh, using this Nuremberg locale for Nazi gatherings, fervent assemblies, marching, patriotism, flag waving, etc., cetera, um, developed in the 1930s. Uh, and here you have Hitler and others in the heart of the square in the old city of Nuremberg. This is a chart um, that is, among other things, a public health chart. At the 1935 Nuremberg rally, the Rump Congress rubber stamp uh, Reichstag passed the Nuremberg Laws. And the Nuremberg Laws decreed who were the people who on various indices, including genetic suitability, should be citizens of the Reich and who shouldn't. And it's very complicated and insane, uh, but for simplification, um, this column says what makes one a Jew. It is a three grandparent rule. And if one is identified on this chart under the Nuremberg laws as a Jew, that meant you're no longer a citizen of the right. It meant you were delicensed from various occupations and barred from various educational institutions and taxed at extraordinary rates and basically pushed to leave your possessions behind and to emigrate. Um, and here's the most perverse part. You don't declare what you are. This is what I believe. This is how I worship. This is how I self-identify. And your description of who your grandparents were is not relevant. A Nazi bureaucrat says, I know who your grandparents really were. They were Jews, thus you are, thus your medical practice, your law practice, your podiatry practice, your et cetera is gone. And thank you for your house and thank you for your shop and thank you for your assets. That's all intra-Germany in the 1930s. In 1939, 
the phony war and the surrenders become a shooting war. These are tanks going into Poland in September of 1939. This is a surrender photograph in Warsaw in 1939. Two weeks and Poland capitulates. And this is a, a boy whose name we'll never know, uh, but a dramatic and heartrending photo of his surrender. And we have this photo because it was in a, an album that Nazi SS officers compiled and distributed to a very select number of top officials as a souvenir of this great achievement. This is, of course, Europe's war, but it becomes the American war. And at first, it's not clear, even with American military, economic, et cetera, buildup and might, which way the war is going to go. But Hitler betrays his ally, the USSR, attacks Russia, Russia stops the Nazi troops on the brink of Moscow, uh, and in time with North Africa and then the Italian landings and so forth, it's clear that inevitably the Allies will win this war. The US, the USSR, the UK are going to win this war. And so beginning in 1942, there are rhetorical footprints of what becomes accountability. This is Roosevelt giving a fireside chat. In October of 1942, in one of his fireside chats, he describes the, the barbed wire that is being looped around the necks of the innocent people on the European continent. It's an elliptical reference to concentration camps and roundups and extermination in the East. And he begins to describe this as a crime. This is a meeting of the foreign ministers in November of 1943 in Moscow. And that's Molotov who is signing for the Russians uh, and that's Cordell Hall, the American Secretary of State, and that's Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Minister. And in this Moscow Declaration, they say that after the war, we together will hold the Nazis accountable for starting this, for doing this. They don't quite say crime, they don't quite say prosecute, they don't say courts, but together and accountable. This is the Yalta meeting in February of 1945, which builds on that, and you can see death kind of etched on the face of Franklin Roosevelt. He's gone in two months. And that senator from Missouri, who in the meantime had become the vice president of the United States, inherits that job and this desk. Notice public health officials, the full ashtray. Um, we've made progress by some measures, right? Um, not even Obama, who might have wanted to do that, got to use the ashtray. And I think President Trump is not ever a smoker. Um, Harry Truman inherits the Manhattan Project, which he knew nothing about, the Yalta Declaration, building on the Moscow Declaration, the imminent victory in Europe, and this project to hold the Nazis accountable, uh, which is about to be Adolf Hitler captured in the dock to be prosecuted. And Harry Truman reaches out for America's leading legal figure, US Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson. Today, that would never happen separation of powers and the executive branch and the judicial branch not sort of teaming up to do work together um, is a good separation. But in these days, there was more of this extrajudicial service. And Truman asks and Jackson says yes in April of 1945. And within two weeks, there is no Hitler and most of the inner circle is also gone. And Jackson finds out that none of the evidence is assembled and none of the international work has been done, uh, but he's on the hook for this job. So with a wry smile, uh, in May of 1945, he embarks on first a diplomatic project. He spends, his <coughs> excuse me, the summer in London. Um, this is called Church House at Westminster Abbey. And they negotiate around a four-sided table how we're gonna do this together. Jackson, Wild Bill Donovan, his deputy, the British, the French, and the Russians. Different legal systems, different concepts, and particularly between the Anglo-American due process system that is familiar to us and the Russian show trial system, there's a fundamental divide. It takes a whole long summer of negotiating. In the meantime, uh, there is no Germany. It has surrendered unconditionally, and it is occupied by the Allies in different sectors, basically on an adjacent basis. The Northwest, closest to England, is the British sector. The Northeast, closest to the USSR, is the Russian sector. The small red, white, and blue in the Southwest, adjacent to France, is the French sector. And 
we're not from the neighborhood, so we get the other piece. The blue is the United States. And this is Austria, which is also occupied, same color scheme, same division. Uh, in the heart of this area is Munich and Dachau and Nuremberg. The American military represents uh, the decision maker, really, and they recommend Nuremberg as the site to do this trial. Not because of the Nuremberg laws and the kind of cosmic justice of that. That's a nice salutary development. No, because it's in our sector, because we can provision it and secure it and do a trial there. Except we had bombed Nuremberg to smithereens. So how could you do that? Well, outside of the old city, this was intact. It is a courthouse building with behind it a prison complex, a wheel and spoke, largely intact prison. And so they go and inspect it. They decide to do it. They fix the roof. They repair the courtroom. And at the Potsdam meeting at the end of that summer in 1945, Joseph Stalin basically agrees to go along with the American model, which is the Justice Jackson, which is the rule of law, which is the fair trial model. And so in August of 1945, they sign an agreement in London creating the world's first international criminal court. And now I connect back to our Constitution, because what it has is the things that look like our Constitution. It has an independent judiciary. It has defined jurisdiction. It has right to counsel for the defendants and right to call witnesses and discovery and so forth, a fair public trial. And that's the trial that commences that fall. And there are the judges of the four nations. Those are the leading Nazi defendants. Uh, Hermann Goering here is the most famous, Hitler's number two. They basically re represented the surviving sectors of Nazism. And what happened in that trial was the prosecution of two types of crimes. One was governmental crime, waging aggressive war, breaching the peace, breaking treaties. And the other was a kind of human rights crime, crimes against humanity, which for the first time is being defined and prosecuted in a tribunal. And that's the human rights crime. That's the individual victim crime. That is, in Germany, a concentration camp inmate. In Poland, an extermination camp slave laborer who was sorted not for the showers, but to live and suffer and be worked to death, but managed to survive death marches. Those crimes are prosecuted. And there's Jackson as the chief prosecutor. He opens in November of 1945 and gives the best courtroom address in the history of the English language. It is gorgeous. Uh, and it defines at a very high plane what the evidence will show about what the Nazis were and what the Nazis did. And it's about the state level crimes and it is about the individual subjugation. The witnesses um, are important, but even more important are the captured documents. You see the, the documentation of the Nazis is really the evidentiary spine of the Nuremberg trial, the planning and the implementation and the reporting, and that's not disputed. Um, for example, Adolf Eichmann, somebody who was believed dead at the time, heads a Jewish office in Berlin supervising this network of camps in occupied territories to reach the final solution of the Jewish question. And reports are flowing from the field to Eichmann's office. And those reports are part of the Nuremberg evidence. Um, this is Eichmann's deputy who testifies to the order he saw, a Hitler to Himmler order directing that the Jews of Europe be exterminated. This is a witness who was missing until midway through the trial. His name is Rudolf Hirsch, and he had been the commandant of the Auschwitz extermination camp in Poland. And then He's captured, and one of the Nuremberg defendants wants him brought to Nuremberg to testify for the defense. How can that help the defense? Well, this man, Colton Brunner, wanted Hearst to testify. Colton Brunner never came to Auschwitz. Okay, that's for the defense, a helpful little fact. But of course, on cross examination, Hearst is asked, and he testifies to what Auschwitz was. And you see behind him, as he sits on the witness stand, the map showing the developing evidentiary understanding of the Holocaust, a word they didn't yet have, but something they're discovering in real time. The tribunal renders its judgments at the end of September, October 1st of 1946. Of the 21 defendants, 18 were convicted, three were acquitted. For Jackson as a prosecutor, in the moment, at least two of those stung. 
no prosecutor likes to lose a case. With just a little bit of reflection, he realized that actually that was the most powerful proof of the fairness of this whole system. That it wasn't 100% conviction rate, that it wasn't 100% death penalties, that it was a range of guilty and not guilty, and yes, some death penalties, but some sentences down to five years. And then Jackson hands off to his deputy and returns to the Supreme Court. The Nuremberg record is published in 42 volumes, plus 12 additional volumes of documents, plus millions of pages not formally published. That's our Holocaust understanding. That's our treatment of others at the level of human rights atrocity understanding. And that's part of this moment in the late 1940s, which is the human rights generative moment. It's the creation of the United Nations, it's the Nuremberg Tribunal, it's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's the Geneva Conventions, it's this sweet spot of value and unity. You know, there'd been a world war and the world had won, basically. And for that moment, they got together and declared and enforced values. And then the Cold War, of course, comes and fractures it. Um, this is the International Criminal Court, which is a modern institution. I just put up this picture to show you it as a descendant of what Nuremberg established. I want to turn back to Jackson and finish on immigration because it sort of shows how a Nuremberg-informed person operationalized some of these human concepts in the context of U.S. constitutional law. So this is Jackson back on the court um, in the late 1940s. This is a levity shot. They weren't always so uh, happy together. Um, but Fred Vinson is the Chief Justice. This is a more grim shot. Um, and this is a glimpse of a case involving Ellis Island. It involves a woman named Ellen Knopf, who was a Czechoslovakian, who had met and fallen in love with and married an American soldier during the occupation of Czechoslovakia in the late 1940s. And pursuant to federal legislation, establishing uniform rules of naturalization, pursuant to Article I, she was the beneficiary of what was called the War Brides Act, which basically meant she got to come to the United States and be a citizen because an American soldier during the occupation had married her and wished her to you know, be with him for the rest of his life. She got as close as Ellis Island. And there, the Justice Department detained her. Why? For secret reasons they could not disclose. And that case goes to the US Supreme Court. The question is, how much of an explanation does the executive department, the attorney general, have to give in exercising immigration powers under these laws that are quite deferential and broad, entitling the executive to protect national security? And in the Supreme Court, the attorney general wins. No sooner does the attorney general win than in a kind of quickie move the next morning, they try and eject Ellen Knopf from Ellis Island back to, to Europe. Um, and there are some other claims that she's trying to raise, raise in a successor case, and this is where Justice Jackson steps in and says, wait a second. He, as the justice whose territory included New York, got to issue an individual order saying not so fast, not just as a matter of fiat and executive power. Yes, you don't have to disclose publicly your reasons, but she's still entitled to additional proceedings and the law requires that you can't just launch her out of here. In time, the government put to its proof, despite having won in the Supreme Court, couldn't carry its statutory burden. And Ellen Knopf became a resident of Westchester County, um, thanks to a judge stepping in with the deference appropriate to the rule, but holding the executive branch to the law of procedure. Fred Korematsu. His parents were immigrants from Japan. He was born in California in the 1920s, and by 1941 was a young man with a fast car and a hot girlfriend uh, working in San Francisco. Pearl Harbor gets attacked. The concern of sabotage and espionage on the West Coast motivates the military to declare the West Coast a military zone. And Congress passes law backing it up with criminal penalties. First a curfew, and then exclusion orders 
requiring people to report to inland areas and then internment of the Japanese Americans. Fred Korematsu says, I'm not going to go. I'm American. I'm loyal. I like my car. I like my job. I like my girlfriend. He, in the back pages of a newspaper, finds some butcher who, for cash after hours, will do surgery on his eyes to try and round them up. Uh, and he uses a fake name, and he claims he's Syrian. Uh, but his Italian-American girlfriend's parents know better, and they're not so crazy about the relationship, and they report him. So Fred gets arrested, and Fred gets prosecuted, and Fred loses, and he has a federal criminal conviction, which goes to the U.S. Supreme Court, which upholds that conviction 6 to 3 in 1944, pre-Nuremberg. On what grounds? National security. The executive branch has its expertise, is an entitled to be um, deferred to in its assessment of military necessity. Three justices dissent in this case, Frank Murphy, Owen Roberts, and Robert Jackson. Each writes, each is a gorgeous dissenting opinion, and in Jackson's opinion, he says the ultimate principle that carries the day is that we don't make criminal procedure in this country based on race. We have an Equal Protection Clause that limits the states, and our Due Process Clause that limits the federal government embodies that same commitment. Whatever other powers government has, it can't be racist. Now, Ellen Knopf is a white woman, so that's not a race case. But the exclusion orders and so-called Muslim ban is religion proxying for race. Uh, and these are the same issues that courts confront today. In the case of Trump versus Hawaii last June, the court, in effect, did a new Korematsu, five to four, for rhetorical cover and because it's a totally safe consensus matter, the court says, well, Korematsu is no longer good law. So in 2017, we have rejected what the Supreme Court did in 1944 in Korematsu. But, I'm sorry, 2018. But we've done our own version of it, five to four in Trump versus Hawaii. And that, of course, brings us back not only to last year's court, but to this year's court. This is the day of Justice Kavanaugh swearing in. You see the tallest figure in the room is the President of the United States, and Kavanaugh and his wife and others beaming. And that's what the court looks like today. It is a hard thing to get a case to the Supreme Court, and it is an unlikely thing for a person making any of these claims to win in the Supreme Court. Fred Korematsu lost, Ellen Knopf lost. There's a long line of losers that I could recite for you. So I don't mean this as a pessimistic point, but I'm saying don't ask the court to rescue us from our worst impulses. Instead, we, need to rescue ourselves from our worst impulses. Because at the level of individual decision making, of personal conduct, of politics, that's who protects human rights. We do, to the extent we get it and see it. And I find it quite heartening to see examples like Fred Korematsu, who I was lucky to know in his old age, and of course Robert Jackson, who I'm lucky to study, um, as examples of seeing it better of noticing it earlier, of getting it right more often than blowing it. Um, and I hope that's what we do. Thank you. I have gone on too long, so if you need to go, of course go, but if there are questions, I'd welcome them. I was hoping for a happier ending there, John, so. I, our, our ending is us, and I have faith in us. I always tell my students there are no shy people in law school. I'm sure there are also no shy people in public health. Um, thank you for speaking to us. Um, I want to go right to this human rights basis that you presented. Um, I'm doing some work now about refugees, the asylum process, um, and especially unaccompanied minors. And I'm learning how difficult it is 
as you probably know, to win an asylum case, not just in the U.S., but pretty much all wealthy nations where people strive to reach for safety. Um, the actual question of who can be a refugee has been on the table for a long time now. And um, for children, it's especially grave. For people who are stateless, um, it's even a bigger problem. Some of them aren't refugees. Some of them are closer to the Karamatsu case. So uh, to make a link between the, the Nazi period um, and what I'm asking, Hannah Arendt, who is one of the great observers and commentators um, on those kind of trials and on that era, also wrote that the question in our times was if uh, the children had a right to rights because we're supposedly born with these inalienable rights, and yet if you don't have a government that can back you up, um, your new country or the country you're seeking to become a citizen or legally a resident of, uh, yet they can leave you in a stateless condition. So how can we reach a place, us, before the court to get beyond a human rights basis to have some guarantees so that all of us have um, a right to rights and if necessary to become refugees? My family came here as refugees. If God forbid we ever had to leave, you know, I'd like to be able to know I have an international guarantee. So what can we look for in the legal sense beyond a human rights regimen? Well, a couple of responses. At the international realm, realm, we are only as strong as our consensus empowers us to be. And right now the international realm is quite fractured and weak and state-based and national prerogative-based. There are international conventions and there are commitments we have made, but the enforcement and the living up to it is a, a national project. Um, at the national level, two responses. Our Constitution protects people against our government, and it's not limited to citizens. It's not even limited territorially, so there are legal issues to be litigated. Uh, but at the first level, or at the basic level, the exercise of government power flows from our politics and our choices in representatives and policy. So, you know, kind of vote, vote, vote um, is probably the most hopeful thing. But, you know, test cases and aggressive litigation, you know, is being pursued and should be pursued too. I just don't, I don't hold out huge hope that a kind of dramatic resolution will come from the judiciary. I just wanted you to talk some more about um, the last thing you said about how it de don't look to the judiciary, it depends on us. Um, I just made a movie about how Medicare got used to desegregate hospitals, and I think that uh, the message of that period is exactly the same, that we we were able to achieve this because there was a social movement, civil rights movement. And I just heard somebody talk on television, whose name I'm afraid I don't remember, who talked about how uh, while it's very nice that the Gateses of the world and the other really rich people are you know, spending their fortunes on uh, malaria prevention, that they will not solve the basic problem of human rights or inequality that the only thing that's going to solve that is a social movement, and the only thing that ever has solved that is a social movement. So I wish that you would talk some more about it depends on us, and what does that mean, and how would we move forward? Well, it's such a huge question, um, and I agree completely. Let me just address it with an anecdote from Nuremberg in December of 1945, so 72, 73 years ago. Um, you know, they're in this American sector of occupation. It is U.S. military controlled. It is where this trial is ongoing. Uh, Jackson and his son and Jackson's secretary and a bodyguard are living in a house that they seized from a German family. Um, but in addition to the prisoners and the witnesses, Germany is filled with refugees, stateless people, displaced persons is what they called it at the time. And a couple of miles from the courthouse is a big DP camp. Um, you know, relatively nice platform tents and some plywood buildings and so forth. Uh, and people who have, you know, survived in horrible condition are being nursed back to health uh, from, you know, older people to children. Um, 
what is striking to me is that many of the people who were involved in the legal project didn't just see the legal project. Um, they kind of also lifted their head up and they sort of saw the human landscape. Um, and they showed this by doing things like stealing ice cream from the PX and taking it to the DP camp to give to children or to the remnants of the synagogues in Nuremberg and Firth that were starting up um, at Rosh Hashanah that year. Um, you know, things like that, um, not just being in your day job or being in your profession, but having a kind of fuller sense of your humanitarian connections um, is something that in those circumstances, a lot of people were good at. Um, I, I don't want to draw a grand conclusion, but maybe today there's not enough reflexive sense of connection. Um, and whatever we need to do to sort of revive that in ourselves, you know, lift your heads up and notice more and then respond um, is, is part of the hope. John, um, I'm trying to recover from the point you left me on that, uh, or left us on that. Um, how much has changed, but not really changed in terms of our our system within the country. But do you think it's the same or worse with respect to the international law? And is it how far are we from? We had a moment there that you well described, um, which wasn't exactly the victor's justice, but it really was, except for who the victors happened to or, be. Well, who else was there is, a, is one of my responses. But And now, with whatever the, whatever the um, our international system is, and you've noted that it's a bit weaker now, what, and it doesn't have an enforcement capacity. So what, how, would you, how would you characterize the current status of, of the legal systems protecting international human rights? There are institutions, you know, the United Nations first among them and the component parts, but, you know, regional and uh, other institutions. Um, and there are formal commitments that are, you know, sort of full and noble from the Universal Declaration through, you know, treaties, et cetera, um, many international conventions. What needs What's missing is the sort of consensus to operationalize them, to address them. There are too many veto points and too many differing sovereign agendas right now. But it's not just that we had this kind of one-time magic moment in 1945 through 47, 48. Um, I do take some heart that we've had at least two because the late 1980s, early 1990s, with the collapse of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, et cetera, was another one of these moments where enough muscle joined the ideals to do some things. For example, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, the creation of the International Criminal Court, those are just legal entities that arose in that moment. Um, so I think what we need to find is things that are shared priorities and work on them first. You know, it's, it's sort of the bullseye. Um, you obviously shoot at the center. It's the, the center of the target is where the biggest action is. Um, and, you know, it may in the criminal law realm be a pariah perpetrator who nobody needs to continue in power, who becomes the person who can be apprehended and prosecuted and held accountable. You know, I don't know if that's Duterte or that's, you know, fill in the blank. I'm not sure who that is. Um, Similarly, it may be a public health problem, or it may be a regional context that's not geopolitically fractious and contended, but is actually something where just consensus can say this matters and we agree that this is how we should proceed. So I take some heart in our noble commitments in our existing institutions and the prospect of finding areas of agreement. But it, it, it takes everybody's constant effort to work on that project. Thank you all very much. <laughs>